you very much, Victor. Thank you for having me. Um, so yes, welcome everyone to the Human Coffee Room. And indeed, it is the space where art meets science. So my name is Jess Hooper. I'm an anthrozoology PhD candidate at the University of Exeter. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the term anthrozoology, I thought I'd start by giving a brief overview. So anthrozoology is the study of human, non-human animal relations. And for the ease of this presentation, I'm just going to refer to animals as animals. I know that humans are animals and I know that that is a problematic term, um, but just for the ease, uh, we'll just be going with animals. So anthrozoology is from anthropology. So we use many of the same methodologies, um, such as ethnography and immersing ourselves in other cultures. So anthrozoology is situated within the humanities and the social sciences, though it tends to be transdisciplinary in nature, because it really depends on the type of relationship that you're looking to explore as to what type of other expertise you're going to need to be engaging with. So my PhD research is about human civet relationships, and I'm also the founder of the civet project, which I'll explain a bit later on. So what are civets? This is a very good question to start with. Uh, they are from the family Viveridae, which is a very ancient family of Feliforma, or cat-like animals. So they've been around for millennium. They've been here as one of the oldest forms of cat-like animals on the planet. They're primarily arboreal, so they're tree-dwelling. They are nocturnal, they're solitary, and because of this, they're very elusive. So the traditional stories of people living alongside civets actually came from their, their sense of smell. So they have a very strong popcorn-like smell, which uh, is a type of musk. And so many of the traditional stories actually are very elusive and they're very uh, mythical because people would say they knew civets lived alongside them because they could smell them, but they couldn't see them. So they knew that they were kind of these elusive visitors in the night. So they are found throughout Southeast Asia. There are some uh, civet species that are in Africa, but the ones that I'm concerned with for my PhD research are in Asia. So civets and civet research came about most frequently, or well, most commonly in 2004, and that's because civets were linked to the outbreak of SARS. So in, in China, civets are uh, used for a luxury meat, um, and so they are farmed. And the poor conditions in which they are farmed uh, actually led to the outbreak of SARS. And so they have been um, researched in the form of uh, epidemiology and disease control, but not so much in their welfare. So civets are also famous for their role in the production of civet coffee. So civet coffee is created through the digestive system of the palm civet. So palm civets have a very varied digestive, um, well, they have a very varied diet. So they are known as mesocarnivores. So although they're part of the carnivore family, um, they are, well, they rely on a huge amount of uh, plant species. So they um, have a very specialist digestive tract. So the digestive enzymes are there to be able to strip away the high protein um, foodstuffs from, uh, from, from meat, but also they have a huge amount of plant matter in their diet as well. So they can have about 200 different species of plants. Um, and so they are a very specialized uh, carnivore in that sense. But in Indonesia, farmers noticed that they were um, they were going into coffee plantations and then they were sampling the ripest coffee cherries. And people didn't really know why they were doing this. Um, but what the Indonesian farmers noticed was that they were leaving their scat in the um, plantations and in their scat, there was coffee cherries. And so the farmers, unable to actually use the coffee that they were producing. This was about 300 years ago in the time of Dutch colonial rule. What they did was they took the civet coffee from the scat. They then processed it the way that you would with normal coffee cherries. So they uh, would clean it, they dried it, they roasted it, 
and then they uh, sampled it. And what they found was that civet coffee was much more um, smooth, it was less acidic, and so it was a very tasty addition to the coffee that they were no longer allowed to enjoy. If we fast forward about 300 years, we find that civet coffee has become very renowned on the international market. Um, so there are claims of only 127 kilograms availability per year for civet coffee. And as it's so rare, uh, they are now saying that they can claim about 48 euros per cup. Now, unfortunately, we know that civet coffee isn't rare. We know that there isn't only 127 kilograms availability per year. Um, and that's because cage production has now overtaken wild collection. So if you see the image on the slide here, you can see that there is a civet in a very traditional civet uh, farm for the production of civet coffee. So civets are, as I said, nocturnal, so they shouldn't be in daylight. You can see that the animal here has cataracts on the eyes. This is because they have been exposed to daylight too often. You can also see that the cage is very small, but also that they can see into the cage next door. So we have uh, civets that can see each other, even though that they are solitary. And so they have a huge amount of stereotypic behavior because they are stressed. So um, self-mutilation, pacing, these are all behaviors indicative of stress. And these are behaviors that we see very frequently in cage production systems. Now, if you look at the floor, you will see that there is a wire mesh and this is a cage designed for ease of fecal collection. And so it's simply designed so the feces of the animal will drop through the enclosure um, and so then into a tray and then the farmer can just simply slide the tray out and grab the feces. So if we were looking at civet coffee that was produced in the wild, it would be extremely rare because civets are only consuming coffee beans that are the ripest they are only consuming them as a matter of taste. So they're only um, having one or two coffee beans at a time. They're not relying on this. So if you were to rely on civet coffee in the wild, the chances of you finding civet scat are very, very slim, but it's even more rare to be able to find enough civet coffee in that civet scat to be able to brew a cup of civet coffee to drink. Um, so we would expect that prices would be very inflated because it's a rare product, but we can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of civets all in a coffee farm um, in order to create tons of civet coffee per year. And they achieve this by having not only many different civets in the facilities, but they also only feed the civets a diet of coffee cherries. And so it's really really bad for them they get caffeine toxicity um, and yeah they die prematurely so we also know that civet coffee is much more available than 127 kilograms because the civet coffee market this year was estimated to grow to 10.9 billion euros by 2030 and you simply cannot create that much uh, money just by having 127 kilograms availability so we know that this product isn't as rare as the claims are, but we also know that there's uh, welfare implications to this coffee. In Indonesia, where the coffee is produced, the Indonesian government will issue permits for civets to be collected from the wild, brought into captivity, um, and then they are used for civet coffee production. Generally, they tend to die after about five years, but there have also been reports of civets being re-released into the wild so that they can recover and then they are recaptured again. So we see that there's this uh, cyclic um, behavior of civet coffee production. So civet coffee success relies on three things. We have these claims of the product rarity, even though we know they're false. Um, if anyone was unfamiliar with civet coffee, if you were to type it into Google now, you're gonna to be told it's the rarest coffee in the world, and you're going to be told that it's the most expensive coffee in the world. So the second reason that civet coffee is so um, 
uh, successful is because there's these claims that it's the most successful and most expensive coffee in the world. So simply by saying this fact over and over and over again, it kind of makes it true. And then the third thing is that the product is meant to be very unique compared to digested varieties. Now, the most uh, commonly cited scientific evidence to say that civic coffee is unique was a paper that was published in 2004 by food scientist Messino Marcone. So Messino Marcone was interested to know whether civic coffee was any different from coffee that had not been digested through a civet. And so he did a few different tests. The primary test he used was SEM analysis, which is scanning electron microscopy. And that's where you run through the civet um, coffee and a control coffee bean through a scanning electron microscope. And then you can see the structural properties of the bean, um, the bean surface um, up to, I think it's uh, 50,000 times magnification. Um, so he found that there was evidence of micro pitting in civet coffee, which is the very, very small holes that are made in the in the structural surface. Um, and he theorized that the civet's digestive enzymes were basically creating these holes in the coffee bean and pulling out the protein. And it's this lack of protein that actually makes the coffee less bitter because it's the proteins in the caffeine that make it strong. And so not only is civet coffee um, very smooth, it's also really weak because it doesn't have a high caffeine content. Now, he also ran some tests for chemical analysis, and he did find that there was a lower protein uh, rate in civet coffee compared to non-digested varieties. Um, and he also did a taste test as well. Um, so he had three primary um, tests. So when I started researching civet coffee in around about 2019, um, I had three questions. I wanted to know that, well, I wanted to know how unique actually is this, given that the most commonly cited paper is in 2004, um, and there wasn't really much in the way of evidence to prove whether this method was um, legitimate or whether there was any um, subjectivity within, within, the, within that. Um, I also wanted to know what was it like for animals whose bodies are mechanized as part of this mouth to anus production line. I knew that the welfare implications were very severe from the few studies that there are into civic coffee production and farming. Um, but I, I didn't really know how it felt to be a machine in the cog of a production line. But really, I was concerned with how can I learn about the civets experience without furthering their exploitation? And one option that was available to me was to travel to Indonesia, to go to the different islands and see civet coffee production in process. But I was a bit concerned with being a human going into the, these systems and simply witnessing animal suffering. I wasn't sure whether that would actually give me much more of an understanding as to the civet's plight or whether I would simply be contributing to those existing hierarchies of domination and control. So in 2020, I was approached by Menelina and Saya Kassanen, who together form the art duo Harry Live Art, um, and they are an art duo from Finland. And they reached out to me through the Civic Project website. So I had created the Civic Project as an expansion of my PhD research. Obviously, in 2020, we were all in lockdown. And so even if I had wanted to go to Bali and see civets for myself, um, I didn't have that option available to me at the time. So I created the Civic Project website as a way of trying to capture people's experiences of um, civet coffee, whether it was as a consumer or as a tourist or even as a farmer, um, to try and get some interviews with people and um, do some qualitative research that way. So I was really pleased when um, Mary and Saya reached out to me. They were about two years in to a four year um, research um, or artistic research project, which was funded by the Kone Foundation and the Swedish Culture Foundation in Finland. And their project was called Collective Perversion Proposal for Reevaluation. And they were interested in investigating the usage of water through the toilet bowl. 
Um, so they were interested in um, human bodily waste, uh, animal bodily waste, how uh, that shapes societal practices, what the ethics are around um, talking about shit and uh, what it really, yeah, all the different kind of cultural connotations that that comes with. So when they learned about civic coffee, they had a very different research question. As performative artists, they were concerned with what could be learned about civic coffee through the utilization of our own mammalian digestive tract. And so when we first started speaking, they told me that they had, before the lockdowns, recently gone to Indonesia. And so I was expecting them to say that they had visited civic coffee uh, farms and that they had um, seen civets. But oh no, <laughs> I found out that they had traveled to Indonesia not to see civets because like me, they were concerned with their role as humans in, in these exploitative systems. And so they traveled to Indonesia. They, with the permission of a local uh, coffee farmer, they spent the day at a coffee farm. They collected coffee cherries and they then spent five days consuming them. And at the end of those five days, they had created 80 grams of the world's first and only human digested coffee. And so immediately I knew I need to work with these people. <laughs> and we started discussing more uh, about our, our various projects, our interests. And we started trading literature and podcasts, and we became very good uh, online friends. Um, and we realized that there was this significant overlap in the ethical questions that we were looking to investigate. What we also realized was that we had a very, very different approach um, and very different kind of professional uh, methods and experiences that we could learn from each other. And so we created a collaborative project called Embodied Perspective. Um, and the Human Coffee Room is one of the outputs from this ongoing collaboration. So I'm going to take you today into a virtual realm of the Human Coffee Room. So we're gonna start in Helsinki and we're gonna start in March of this year at the Gallery Forum Box, which is where Harry Live Art had their solo exhibition. So it's through these doors that we will go today, and we are now entering the Human Coffee Room. So this is one of the exhibitions that was uh, on show for uh, one month in March, and we are going to explore um, uh, several of these works that are, are in this ex exhibition piece. So the first thing in this space, we have the research table. You can see there are two uh, screens on display. Uh, there is sound, uh, so we can um, listen through headphones into, into one. Um, there is a research paper, and there's a little Perspex box, which we will revisit in a minute. There is also Coffee H Live Art, which is the name given to the world's only human digested coffee, which you can see in the display plinth in the circular image on the right. There is an educational board, a painting which hangs at the back, which shows the process of digestion. So the bean entering into the mouth or the cherry entering the mouth it passing through the digestive tract, it having these world-making potentials with the digestive enzymes, it exiting the body through the anus, and then it being cleaned, dried, roasted, and brewed into coffee. And this is the exact same process that a civet would, would experience. We also have a 3D coffee bean, which is made from clay. You can see this in the left-hand plinth. Um, this is an exact replica of one of the coffee beans that pass through one of the artist's digestive systems. And then we have the front and reverse uh, SEM, SEM imaging um, display of the human digested coffee beans, which I will show you a little later on. So let's start then with the research table. So in the little Perspex box that I said we would revisit, in there is a variety of coffee beans. Uh, we have three samples. 
Sample one went through the first artist, sample two went through the second artist, and sample three was our control study. So this was our control sample, so coffee beans that had been uh, collected by the artists from the same plantation on the same day um, and had been dried in the same process, but that hadn't been through the human digested tract. And the reason they are displayed in this Perspex box is because they are coated in platinum. And these were the, um, the samples that we then conducted our scanning electron microscopy uh, research with. So we were following Messino Marcone's um, process. I also see the two screens here. Now there's someone listening in on the screen uh, that you can't see. And that is our performative uh, video. So this was first presented in 2020 at a conference hosted by the European Association of Critical Animal Studies. And it was actually the first of our collective outputs as part of our collaborative um, research. And we submitted this piece under the category Becoming With. It was a combination of our projects. We wanted to explore the ethics of fecal commodification um, and what it would mean um, from an ethical stance if we were to replace the body of one animal for the body of another, um, specifically the human. So through this video, not only do we demonstrate trans-species relationships and the world-making potential of digestive enzymes and plant matter, but we also challenge the speciesism which is inherent to the civic coffee industry. So I'm going to play you the video now. It's about 13 minutes. Uh, for the first minute to a minute and a half, there is no sound and the sound will, will kick in after. The palm civet is a mostly nocturnal mammal, living in tropical forests in South Asia. Civets are omnivores in the wild, but mainly feed on fruits. The faeces of the palm civet is the centrepiece of the particular high-end global civet coffee trade. The civet coffee derives from beans that have been eaten by and passed through the digestive tract of a palm civet. This coffee is produced by parting the semi-digested bean from the dried scat, after which the intact beans are cleaned, dried and roasted. The tradition of brewing civet coffee from beans gathered in the wild is found in several regions across southern Asia, and the tales of how it was first discovered and came into cultural use has local variations. The common narrative states that it coincided with Dutch colonialism, when large-scale imported monocrop coffee plantations were enforced on the Indonesian islands. Today, civet coffee is exported and marketed through the traditional narrative of wild collection. Yet there is no reliable certification of wild sourcing, and government permits are issued for mass caged production. If I would meet Palm Sivet and see her, her eyes with which she would be looking back at me, her mouth, tongue, throat, stomach, intestine, gut flora, the digestive tract. Could I gain knowledge? through our shared biological processes.
I see a vast landscape on top of the hillside. The brisk air fills my lungs while I look at a valley that lingers below. The plantation is before me. Through straight rows it is easy to navigate between the bushes. Like pearls, the red cherries shine in contrast to the deep green leaves. I instinctively choose one. I hold it between my fingers. It feels firm and the peel is glossy. I put it in my mouth. My teeth pierces the skin. It is bitter. Under the bitterness, the flesh is revealed. Sweet, but not much, compared to the size of the seeds nesting inside. The coffee beans. I have a strong image of you in my mind. In the middle of the night, solitary, eating juicy cherries and avoiding humans who used to call you a thief before your shit could be translated into money. This is how global commodity chains brought it to me and I followed it to you. I am a stranger in this place the other, knowing too little of the lives lived here. Coffee does not grow where I'm from, so I took the risk and I do this as cautiously as possible, not to catch the attention. I'm afraid of offending them and their culture through my research methods. I'm afraid to be misunderstood as an extremist. What would they say if they knew, if they knew that I came all the way here, across half of the planet, disguised as a tourist, to become closer with you? I collect the cherries, one by one, into a container that I borrowed from the plantation owner, and I return to my hiding place. There I start selecting, cleaning, peeling, counting. Counting everything that goes in, to know how much to expect to come out. For me this is now an experiment. I'm analytical, calculative, and a bit concerned if I will be able to digest this. One. Two. Three, four, five. Sweat drops are forming on my upper lip. My intestine seems like a pearl necklace. Resistance. Forcing. I think of you, your heritage commodified. Days are passing while we continue counting and eating. This house feels like a cage.
I see you. We pace back and forth between where we eat and where we shit. The human is a mostly diurnal mammal, living in various climates, inhabiting all temperate continents. The human is an omnivore, producing most of her food through agricultural practices. Human faeces is a species specific taboo in many cultures, while other animals' excrements are utilised as materials or for producing a wide range of products, civet coffee being one of them. It is the digestive enzymes and encounters with microbiomes which alter the bean's physical structure, creating a distinctive taste to the brewed coffee. In the footage that you are watching, we employ the human gut flora to replace that of the civet, in an attempt to shed light on human attitudes and to embody understanding of the process of civet coffee, faecal commodification and the civet. Our experiment resulted in 80 grams of physically created human coffee beans. The production process technically paralleled the production of civet coffee by separating the semi-digested beans from the scat, after which the intact beans were cleaned and dried. Civet coffee has been publicised by celebrities and public figures. Stephen Fry bought a packet for Prince Charles, it appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show, and it was featured in the film The Bucket List, with Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson. How would human coffee be promoted? And by who? For civic coffee, false claims of less than 127 kilograms availability per year keeps the prices and rarity status high. Not only has consumer demand increased export, civic coffee tourism has emerged at curated sites. Here the civet is placed on display in cages as a spectacle within showroom gardens which are promoted as agro-tourism. Introducing human coffee for market production may liberate the civet from industrial cages, but it does require us to reflect on the ethical implications of exchanging one being for another. When utilising living beings for such an experiment, one must form conclusions with delicacy. We need to carefully watch our arguments not to unintentionally traverse racist ideologies. While global consensus states that enslaving humans is wrong, the human-animal binary persists. Consumptionism pushes the civet to transgress, from wild animal towards biomechanical, mouth-to-anus production line. Would we employ the same industrial monotony to our own species, to exchange the freedom of our own gut in order to enhance our taste buds? For now, our product, unmarketed and unsold, waiting in the stage of unroasted beans, is the heritage of knowledge. An understanding of shared biological vulnerabilities to exploitation. Okay, so that was the process of digesting 
and cleaning and drying the coffee beans. Um, and so really that was our exploration of the ethics of bodily mechanization. Um, and we used the human bodily experience to do that. And then the next thing we wanted to do was to understand what we had created or what the artists had created. And so we wanted to know, was the civet truly unique in their abilities to create a unique coffee? Um, and we also wanted to test the reliability of the authentication process, which is used to determine civet coffee from non-digested coffee. Now, the other thing we wanted to do was to promote transdisciplinary methods um, and to promote collaborations between the sciences, the humanities and the arts, because we had found that not only had our work with each other created what we felt was a very successful collaboration, but in working together and between and within disciplines in which our methods had merged, we found that it simultaneously helped our collaborative project and it also strengthened our independent research. And so we decided we would follow the same methods as food scientist Massino Marcone, who, as I said, was responsible for the paper that is now most widely cited um, as proof that civets are unique in their ability to create a unique product. Um, and so we took the human coffee beans to a lab in Brighton um, in the UK, and we collaborated with Dr. Jonathan Salvage, who has um, years and years and years of experience in SEM imaging. Um, and so he kindly joined us and he is now co-author on our paper. And so with his expertise, we were able to follow step by step the same method that Messino Marcone had employed for civic coffee. And so we ran our human coffee and our control sample through the, the scanning electron microscope. So the first thing we did was we coated our beans in four nanometers of platinum. And that's because to um, run organic material through a scanning electron microscope, you have to make the, um, the organic matter, you have to make it um, uh, conductive. And so you have to coat it in a conductive material. Uh, John found this quite hilarious uh, because not only had we brought him the world's rarest coffee, um, we were then coating it in platinum. So we certainly were making it the most expensive. Um, but anyway, it was part of the research process. So once we had coated our coffee beans in the platinum, we then ran it through the scanning electron microscope um, and we scanned our images at 1,000, 5,000 and 10,000 times magnification. And the reason we did it at these magnifications is because this was the magnification that was stated in the Messino Marconi paper. Given that we were doing our research 10 years or so after this initial publication, the technology we were using was more advanced. So we could have gone to, um, to magnifications much, much higher, but we chose to keep it comparable because we wanted to be able to compare our human digested sample with the civic coffee sample that was published in his paper, because that meant we wouldn't need to collect civic coffee of our own. We wouldn't need to purchase civic coffee. We wouldn't need to enter into those exploitative systems. We could simply compare our images to ones that had already been published. And we felt that was much more ethical. Unfortunately, after about six hours or so of um, scanning the beans, we then tried to compare our scans with those that were published in the Messino Marcone paper. And what we found is that it was really difficult to compare between the, the images. Um, and thankfully, because Jonathan has this wealth of knowledge, he was able to very quickly identify that the images that were published in the Messino Marcone paper, although they were stated that they were 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 magnification, actually those images were 100, um, they were 
sorry, I'm getting distracted by by the camera images. Um, but the the magnifications were actually much lower. And so the images that were published in the paper were only 100, 500 and 1000 times magnification, not 1000, 5000, 10,000, as it's stated in their methods. And so whilst we're sure that the that the uh, magnifications that they explain in the paper were 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. The images that they had chosen to publish alongside those results were 100, 500, 1,000. And so we felt that in order to make a comparison between civic coffee and human coffee, we would need to run the analysis again and actually reduce that magnification. Um, and so that's what we did. So here is um, an image of, so this is me filming on my phone, the um, SEM analysis in process in the lab. And you can see that we have our platinum coated coffee beans uh, that we're able to manually bring up closer to the electrons that are being fired. The electrons bounce off of the platinum coating um, and then it generates an image of the structural properties um, up to the magnification that was specified. So for each bean, we took four different images at those six different magnifications. Um, so we split the coffee bean into quarters. So each coffee bean front and back had um, four quarters um, that were then imaged. So this is one of an example, this is an example of one of the scans. So you can start to see it coming into focus here. This is actually the um, kind of crust area um, of the coffee bean, which flakes off. So some of the coffee beans had this, some of it didn't. Um, and the reason I can tell which part of the bean it is, is because it's got these really long kind of striated um, sections. And this is the uh, fibers which are in the, the husk of the bean. So when the husk is removed, it leaves a much smoother surface. And so we had that displayed on our research table as well. Um, and then around the outside of our research table, we had the first, uh, well, yeah, the non-revised version of our manuscript. So it was really important when we were thinking about the human coffee room, we were wanted to have an output that was, um, had a longevity that went beyond the end of the exhibition. And so we wanted to make sure that we had an academic output and that we had a paper that explored the process of um, the, the commodification of the human digestive tract, um, the embodied empathy methods that we are employing through the human body, um, and the SEM analysis as well. And so we published a paper called Technologies, Bodies and Fecal Matters, Embodied Empathy with Coffee Producing Civets, and that um, has actually been published this week, which is a happy coincidence. Um, so that's now available open access in the journal Transpositions, which is a journal for transdisciplinary and intermedial cultural studies. Now, the reason that we decided to uh, publish with Transpositions is because it has a heavy focus on transdisciplinary research. Um, and we felt that it was really important to have our work available as a kind of promotion of these transdisciplinary methods um, and the, the meeting of art and science. And so you can see in the image here, this is the original Messino Marcone paper. So we did follow this, the same methodologies um, and we did lay out our paper in a similar way, but we also included um, the importance of ethical exploration um, and we also included a section on the bodily experience and the psychological experience that the artists had when they were consuming such large quantities of caffeine. And so looking at our results then, uh, we found that there was evidence of micro pitting in our human digested coffee. So this was very, very small holes in the coffee bean surface that were only evident in coffee which had been passed through the human digestive tract. Uh, they weren't evident in our control sample. 
Now, this was really interesting because Messino Marcone found the same thing for civic coffee. So when we compared our human coffee to the civic coffee, um, as was published in his paper, we couldn't find any significant differences. And so our results indicate that both civets and humans can create micro pitting by ingesting and processing coffee beans through the digestive tract. Now, we also found through our analyses that the authentication process that is advocated for by Marcone, so the use of SEM imaging, whilst it is a quantitative method and it did generate some very interesting results, the structural properties of a coffee bean are so varied and so diverse and you can create as many magnification images as you like, there is certainly, uh, there, it's definitely open to subjectivity. We could have chosen very different images to compare to um, the Marconi paper. Um, and so we're not recommending that it's a robust method for authenticating um, civic coffee or human coffee. So we believe that our research is significant because we have shown that civets are not unique in their ability to alter the physical properties of coffee. Uh, humans can also create coffee of a very similar structural characteristic. Um, but mostly we feel that our embodied perspective or what we name in the paper is embodied empathy allows us to, as Haraway would say, become with our non-human interlocutors without contributing to the existing hierarchies of exploitation and human domination that has led to their exploitation in capitalist systems in the first place. And in our paper, we also confirm that whilst at the beginning of our research, we knew that the civic coffee industry was lying when it says there is 127 kilograms availability, but also they are lying when they say that it's truly unique. Now, one thing to bear in mind as well is that um, the coffee industry is um, one of the most um, at risk uh, food products um, for food fraud. And so the majority of civic coffee that is listed as wild collected is actually produced through caged methods. And um, whilst we were doing literary analysis of civic coffee, we found a paper had been published, uh, I think it was in 2019, that had critiqued the Messino Marconi paper and had found that actually the coffee beans that he was examining were unlikely to have been the variety he believed them to be. So there is serious concerns about the authentication process because it's not guaranteed that what you are testing is what you think it is in the first place. So the final part of our human coffee room was an auction because we wanted to see whether the product that had been created could hold the same economic worth or could compete economically with that of civic coffee. So we had addressed its unique properties or not. We had addressed the product's rarity or not, um, but we needed to conclude with um, understanding whether anyone would be interested in purchasing a coffee that had been produced through the human digestive tract. So in the last week of the auction, uh, the last week of the exhibition, we held an online auction. And what's important to note is that we didn't sell this as an artwork, although that would make for a very interesting paper, because whether this has accumulated value because of its art or whether it's because of its product as coffee um, is kind of to be debated. Um, so we didn't want to set the price as you would expect for a public work of art, say in the tens of thousands of pounds. So what we wanted to do is to use it more of an experiment um, and a, a kind of advocacy call for civets. And so what we did is we placed 20 grams, which is one cup of human digested coffee. We placed that for auction at the same price as you would pay for one cup of civet coffee. So we started the bidding at 48 euros. 
And after one week, we had sold our one cup of human coffee for 540 euros. And so we were able to say that through our project, we had not only created the world's rarest coffee, we had not only created coffee that was as structurally unique as civic coffee, but we had also managed to challenge civic coffee's economic claims uh, because we now have the world's most expensive coffee. And to give you um, some figures, um, civic coffee for one cup can typically sell for about 48 euros per um, 20 grams. So if you were to have a kilo of that, that's about 2,400 euros. Of course, you can buy it wholesale for significantly less, but it's still, still very high value compared to other coffees. Uh, human coffee at 540 euros per 20 grams would equate to 27,000 euros for a kilo. So we have uh, substantially um, outcompeted civic coffee. But of course, we still have 60 grams of human coffee remaining. And so we want to continue our research. Um, firstly, I have to say that there are limitations in our study, as of course there always is with science. Um, Marconi didn't just scan his coffee beans. He also performed an SDS page analysis and taste test. So he measured the protein content in civic coffee compared to non-civic coffee. And so we are looking to do the same. Um, so we will be performing an SDS page on our human digested coffee to see if those micro pitting um, signs actually did lead to the stripping of proteins as has been claimed for civic coffee. Um, and then the next thing we will do after that is to auction the remaining 60 grams. And it's our reasoning that given that every time a cup of human coffee is sold, it leaves less and less available in the world. On that basis, we should be able to accumulate even more value. Um, and so we would expect that the next 20 grams would sell for more than the previous and so on and so forth. So that will be coming shortly. Um, if anyone would be interested in following uh, the auction um, and seeing how that goes, please do reach out um, and we will add you to our mailing list. So that is your whistleblow tour of the Human Coffee Room. You can find me at thecivicproject.com. You can find uh, Mary and Saya from harryliveart.com. Um, and there's also their email address, should you wish to uh, reach out to them and ask about their experience in uh, digesting the, civic, uh, the, the coffee.